We've been looking at the whole armor of God. I believe this is number seven, which is interesting because there's about seven things associated, yay, eight, with the whole armor. We'll include prayer, and uh, prayer would be the eighth thing, but the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer go together. We'll see that. But this is number seven, and I call it the final pieces. What we're going to see is that with this whole arm of God, the final pieces are offensive pieces, as it were, or weapons. Uh, Look with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter number 6, and we'll start, just for context, we'll start right at verse number 16. He says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We saw last time that the, the above all, the thing that you need most is faith in the, the Word of God. You can have all of God's Word, which you do. You're going to have the truth. But if you don't believe what God's Word says, it won't do anything to stop Satan in your life. He says, above all, verse 16, taking the shield of faith. What's going to protect your entire body is the 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 issue of faith, trusting God's word. He says, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Remember those Roman soldiers, one of the ways they were attacked, their enemies would shoot fiery darts to try to get them in the, in the masses and, and, and burn them up. And you can quench that. We saw don't quench what the spirit is trying to say, Paul said, but you do quench the fiery darts of the wicked, that satanic policy of evil to overthrow the truth by faith. You know, people ask me, what is it that that makes you endure all the years in the faith? And I said, faith, trusting God's word. There's no secret formula, but trusting God's word, obviously getting it in me, having it, getting it in me, but it is believing what God's word says, what the scriptures say. That's the answer for Satan. We're going to see that. Notice in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That helmet of salvation, we saw what... It protects your mind. A helmet protects your head. Your head is where your brain, your mind is. And remember that salvation was that hope of salvation. God is going to rapture the body of Christ out to the heavenly places before he pours out his wrath, the time of Jacob's trouble. And God wants us to know that we're not. As you look at these, this world getting worse and worse, and it is. Just turn the television on, ISIS, the Middle East. All that focus is... The stage is being set for the prophetic days with Israel in the future. But before we, before we, before God does that, we're going to go out of here. He says we're going to be saved from the wrath to come. That's a wonderful thing. Satan wants you to believe that, hey, you're going to go through all of that. And that's going to make you troubled like he did the, 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 in 2 Thessalonians with the Thessalonians. And Paul says, no, we're not going to go through that. Well, put that on. Put that in your thinking. But now, look at the next part of this armor. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to take some time tonight to see what a sword is in Scripture. Uh, When you look at Scripture, this is an offensive weapon. A sword is a weapon of warfare to slay, to destroy, and to execute wrath. I'll say that again. In the Scripture, a sword is a weapon of warfare to slay, to destroy, and to execute wrath. Now, there was another type of weapon used in Old Testament times, the bow and arrow. And you remember when God flooded the earth back here in times of Noah, he he said, I will put my bow in the cloud. My wife and daughter were out, and it it didn't rain, but it looked cloudy a couple days ago. But it was a beautiful rainbow (coughs) out there. You guys, maybe some of you guys saw it. And so they took a picture of it. And I'm always reminded that God first put that bow in the clouds back there in Genesis, I think chapter 8. And he promised Noah and humanity he would never flood the earth with a flood. And to this day, we can see that beautiful seven-colored rainbow. God has in sevens, those colors. And that's his bow. That's his weapon. And he says, I'll never use this weapon again. He puts his bow down like a warrior. So just like the bow, both the, the bow and this sword existed before mankind, which is interesting. I, I, was, I, was, I was thinking about a bow. I was thinking about a, 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 a a sword as well. Both of those weapons existed before mankind. So I thought about that. I said, why would that be? Why does why does God, why does spirit have a sword? Why does God have a bow? Because he's a man of war. There was a satanic rebellion in the heavens. And God is has, is, has declared war on his enemy, Satan. 
He is working out those purposes first through the nation of Israel. Most of your Old Testament is about how God is going to take out Satan on the earth through the nation of Israel. But one of the things God did not let people know that the Gentiles down here, you and me, were going to be used of God in the body of Christ. That's what happened when Paul was saved. The body of Christ began and God's going to take this, this vehicle called the body and put us in the heavenly places. We're going to battle, well not we, we're battling now, but we're going to be put into those positions of rank and authority up there, the joint heirs, and all the positions uh, in the heavenly places, every name that is named, the body of Christ. We're going to go up there and, and he's going to defeat Satan, get him out of there and put us up there. That's the purpose and plan of Almighty God and we're a part of that. But right now we battle the, the enemy. Notice it says, verse 17, the sword of the spirit. It's the spirit sword. And what is it? The word of God. Let's look at some verses. Uh, before we look at the first time it's used, go to Hebrews chapter 4. Go to Hebrews. Go um, right after Paul's epistles. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter number 4. Let's see what the Bible says about this sword of the spirit. If I gave you a sword and then someone attacked you, I would believe that you would use that sword to fend off the attack. You would use the shield to fend off the attack, but what you can do is also go on the offensive with the sword, like those Roman soldiers with a sword. And what we're going to see is that God's word is to be used by the believer to attack back the enemy. You're going to see this. You might wonder sometimes, I'll go through a lot of verses, and I have, I'll read them out loud, or sometimes I'll say, you read them out loud. Ryan will say this verse, I say, read that. Dorothy will say this, I say, read that. And, and, and why I do that is because I know that Satan hates to hear the word of God. Preach right, preach right. He hates to hear the word of God right. When he says to Eve, he loved it when she watered down the word and added to the word. Uh, yeah, hath God said, she says, yeah, he says we can eat up all the, the, the trees of the garden and so forth. She watered things down, added to it. He loved that. What he doesn't love is for you to give the word of God in truth. He hates to hear it. That's why we, we preach the word of God. What did Paul tell Timothy? Preach the what? The word. Make sure you're preaching God's word. And we're going to see that that's an offensive weapon. Let's look at it. Hebrews chapter number 4. It's a very popular uh, passage. Look at verse 12. For the word of God is quick. That word quick is alive. It's quick, it's alive and powerful. He says, the words I speak, they're spirit and life, the Lord said. They're powerful. There's power there. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. There's your inner man. And of the joints and marrow, there's that, the body, the physical body. Now watch this. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God can read you. It will read you. It reads your motives. What the Lord Jesus Christ will do with the judgment seat of Christ, he not only looks at our actions and so forth, he looks at the, per the, 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 the counsels of our heart, why we did what we did, the motivation. Interesting enough. God's word can do that. That's why you want to have a, a, a soft heart. Uh, uh, honest heart. Let me show you the first time this word sword was used. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis. We're going to be going through the, uh, the, the, the Bible tonight. And we're going to go right on through back to our passage. And I want to show you some things about a sword in the Bible. I was looking at this first time a sword is used. And usually the first time a word is used in the Bible, it kind of sets the precedent. Precedent. When you study the Bible for a while, I always look at the first time it's used because it kind of sets the precedent. I want to show you the precedent of Genesis chapter 3, verse 24 when it comes to a sword. If you remember, it is when God kicked out the man and his wife because they ate of the tree. Remember, I was just talking about that. One of the things God did... Instead of allowing Adam free access to the Garden of Eden, if Adam wanted to come into the presence of the Lord, he had to now bring a sacrifice. So let me show you what it says here. Verse number 22. After he clothed them, because they were naked, but they lost that glory of God. So now they know they're naked. They try to cover themselves with fig leaves 
That represents religion. Religion won't work. Religion is just you trying to cover yourself to God. God has to cover you. Verse 21. And Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. All that is a substitutionary, redemptive purpose in Jesus Christ. When God clothed Adam and Eve, mostly in a lamb, probably in a lamb skin, what he was doing was he was showing them that an innocent lamb has to die. We have to shed his blood. And God has to clothe them. He has to give them righteousness. It was a type and shadow of what the Lord Jesus Christ would eventually accomplish on the cross. Notice in verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now Adam had this conscience, conscience, with knowledge. He had a built-in conscience for good and evil. God wanted to be the one to tell Adam what good and evil was. God's word was supposed to tell Adam, but now Adam had this conscience. Well, notice what happened. And now, lest, lest he put, this verse 22, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now imagine if God allowed Adam to live forever in that horrible, sinful state. Adam lived 930 years. And eventually, his body, because of sin, wore out. But it took a long time back then in the creation. People lived 900, 800, 700, 600. It got, the the, the uh, ages got less as we went on. But Adam lived 930 years. But notice something. Look what it says in verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, Eden kicked him out, to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now Adam's going to be a farmer and take care of the ground. Now, I've always read this in time past a different way, this verse 24, but it hit me what's going on. Now watch verse 24. It's, sometimes we'll read it a certain way or see it or people will talk about it. But I'm looking at this over the last few days and I'm saying, this is saying something even different because I've been focused on sword. Watch this. Verse 24. So he drove out the man. He kicked him out. To drive him out. So he, Adam didn't want to go. It's almost, it's, think about an eviction. That's a good way to think about it. That's when I, he, he said, it's time to go. Your time. He evicted him out of there. You can't be here because I'm here. I'm holy. You're God. He kicked him out. But God didn't just send him out like, like he's going to do with Cain. God's going to allow, well, he did allow Cain until Cain didn't want it. God's going to allow access to him, but you got to come with the sacrifice now. you got, you got to have some blood. Every human being ever born has to come to God with some innocent blood. Problem is, there was only one innocent human being that ever lived, and that's the Lord Jesus. And so through his shed blood, you know what Paul says? Even when, when, when God shed that first lamb's blood and Adam and all them, all through time, every time they did a blood sacrifice, God himself, Romans 3, was looking back. Excuse me, God himself was looking forward. And in the, in the work of the cross, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that blood was used, we'll see that when we get to Romans, as a payment. God allowed uh, humans to sacrifice animals because God was looking forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden. So on the east side, on your side over here, Adam would go out, but on the east side of the garden, they had to come west. He put something. Watch what it says. It says, placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, verse 24, cherubims. Now, if you're not familiar with cherubims, they're this creature. Lucifer himself was a cherubim. The book of Isaiah said he was the anointed cherub that covereth. A cherub is a, is a beast that has four faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. It has the body of a man and so forth, hoof feet and so forth. It's, it's a creature that's around the throne of God. So that means God's presence is there. Wherever you see the cherubim in scripture, the Lord's presence is there. So the Lord is on the earth at this time. Notice verse 24. He says, placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, cherubim. Now, I used to read it as the cherubim are holding the sword. I, I, he says cherubims, okay? So you got at least two. Because if it's a cherub, it's one, cherub. So you got cherubim. So you got at least two. 
Now, usually the sense is that they're holding that sword like that. But that's not what it says. See, now, now watch this. It's interesting. He says cherubims, comma, and a flaming sword. Because sometimes we visualize two cherubims standing there with the swords, you know, kind of stopping people from giving in. Each of them. But he didn't say swords. He says a cherubims, comma, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So it just hit me. So what I think is going on, they're standing there pr protecting God's presence, but right in between them, there's this flaming sword just standing there. And you're just like, what? What is this flaming sword? Well, it's the word of God. When God expelled Adam, he says, you cannot come unless you have to. And that flaming sword stood there as a barrier between man and God. And the only way that flaming sword would be removed is when they come to offer their sacrifice. So look at because because I would think if if it was both cherubim holding swords, it said who the cherubim with flaming swords. But it says a garden of Eden. He put the cherubims, comma, and a flaming sword which turned every way. It's what Hebrews was saying about the Word of God. Right, my Word is like it's a fire. Yeah, it's a fire. We're going to see some of that. We're going to see how it's a fire. It's just interesting that once God sentenced Adam, that flaming sword appeared and he says, you can't even come next to me without the blood. Now, if he brought the blood, the sword would be removed. Because now the word of God is not prohibiting them. But unless you have the blood. Interesting. I just, I just, as I was reading that over and over, I thought, my vision was that it was two cherubim with swords, you know, garden. But no. The cherubim represents God's presence. They, they stand around his throne. But the thing that was actually, keep, get this, the thing that was actually keeping man from just freely coming into God's presence was his word. It was that flaming sword. Isn't that interesting? And that's been all. That's why I say a sword existed before man fell. God Himself has a sword. The Lord has a sword. I would bathe my sword in heaven. He He had weapons of warfare for Satan even before He created Adam. It's just interesting. He's a the Lord is a man of war. So I just found that interesting that it was the Word of God, not these guys holding swords, but it was a sword. It's hard to say. I mean, you know, think about it. Just, it was just a flaming sword that just stood up there. You know, God it appeared from the word of God. That's just interesting. Let's look at some more. Go over to Joshua chapter 5. Uh, you get the five books of Moses, Deuteronomy and all that. And then go over to uh, Joshua chapter number 5. As Joshua takes the nation of Israel into the land of Canaan, the promised land. Something happened when he went down to Jericho, or at the gates of Jericho. He sees this unusual man Let's see what it says. Look at Joshua chapter number 5. Now, just for time's sake, um, we have a little time. I'm going to just read down through it because it's a beautiful picture of what's going on in Israel. I don't want you to miss any of it. So, look at Joshua chapter number 5. Although we're to study Paul's epistles, we can go and look at the other parts of Scripture. As long as we rightly divide them, understand who's talking to whom. We know the book of Joshua, just like Moses' books. Just like all the books of the Bible, except the 13 letters of Paul, speak to the nation of Israel, to the Hebrews. That's why after Paul's epistles, you have Hebrews to Revelation, okay? You've got to rightly divide the scripture. But let's see how he dealt with Israel. Verse number 1. And it came to pass in Joshua 5, verse 1, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we, Joshua's writing this, until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. Everybody understands that God opened up the Red Sea to allow them to escape Egypt, but also as they're coming into the land, he opens up the Jordan River. He has Joshua put these 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan River as a testimony. It's when John was baptizing in the Jordan. He was right there. When the Lord Jesus was there uh, at the Jordan River, he says, God is able of these stones 
to raise up children unto Abraham. There was some stones of testimony right in the Jordan River today. There's a testimony because he dried it up. Well, notice here in Joshua chapter 5, verse 2. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. <clears throat> now remember, the book of Joshua comes 40 years after they left Egypt. While they were in the wilderness, causing trouble for the Lord, most of them, all this new generation did not get circumcised. So now that these young ones, these little ones, are grown, God's going to, before they get into the land, circumcise them according to that Abrahamic covenant. So he's going to circumcise them. Look at verse number um, 3. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. By the way, that's where you get circumcision from even today. People circumcise. Not for religious purposes, unless they're Jews. Uh, it's, it's just cultural now. But that's where they came from, from God and Israel, uh, Abraham. Verse number 4. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. So here's why. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, did what? Died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. It's just interesting. I told you about that NIV when it says in Hebrews 3.16 that all the people who came out of Egypt died. But what happened was only the men of war, the ones who were part and parcel of the conspiracy to deny God's truth that he could work through Israel, they're the ones who died. In fact, that's why Israel spent 40 years. He would wait for that generation of men of war to die off. That's why it took 40 years. It shouldn't have took them 40 years. They should have got over there in a few days. It took 40 years so these men could die. Notice in verse 5. Now all the people that came out were circumcised. But all the people that were born in the wilderness, see that? The born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. So all these little ones. Verse 6. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord swore that they, he, excuse me, unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers that he would give us, the us, by the way, is Joshua, first person, a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. So everybody got it? They come out, and for 40 years, there was no circumcising in the wilderness. Okay, here we go. Verse 8. And it came... But by the way, God never intended for any uncircumcised people to be in his land. <clears throat> if you were a stranger and you wanted to live in Israel, let's say you were a, a Gentile. All of us are Gentiles. So back there, we could not be part of what is God was doing with Israel. Even during the Lord's earthly ministry, a lot, a lot of people are surprised to learn that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, that's not to us Gentiles. That's Israel under the law. He, that Gentile woman who wanted to talk to him and, and, and be uh, have, have her, that, that devil cast out of her daughter in Matthew 15, he wouldn't even talk to her. He ignored her. He answered her not a word. Everywhere he saw Jews, he talked to them and, and healed them. He wouldn't heal not. If you were sick and you said, oh, Lord, help me, he just ignored you. Not because he didn't love you. What did he say? I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He blessed Israel. The children must first be fed. We were Gentile dogs. Yea, Lord, the, the dogs get the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She took her, that Gentile woman, who would be one of you ladies right there, you would have to say, oh, Lord, I'm a dog. Give me the crumbs. And he says, okay, bam, there you go, dog, there you go. Now, the Lord is not unkind. He's perfect. He just understands that the Father's will is that he bless Israel first. It's not until the Lord Jesus Christ comes down in Acts 9, saves the Apostle Paul by his grace, sends them out with a message of grace and peace to us Gentiles that you and I could go directly to God through Jesus Christ. Before Paul, no Gentile could just go to talk to God or the Lord. They would, these Jews would stone us if we tried to do that. Get off of our Lord. Peter and them with the lady. This was a woman with a, a daughter. They were like, Lord, send her away. Get rid of her. They didn't want that. You saw how Peter was in Acts 10 
when God tried to send him to that Gentile, Cornelius, Peter says, no, Lord, I'm not going. God forced him to go. That was after Paul was saved, see? Now, once Paul was saved in Acts 9, God sends Peter in Acts 10 to Cornelius so that later at the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15, Peter can stand up for Paul's ministry. Interesting enough, after Acts 15, or excuse me, Acts 15, you don't even see Peter anymore. Peter went from the head apostle to Israel, and at Acts 15, you don't even hear from Peter. He's done. The ministry is done, because God is doing something new to us Gentiles through Paul's ministry. That's how you rightly divide God's word. All right, let's look back at this circumcision. Verse number 8. And it came to pass when they, that's Israel, had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. So they had to heal up. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Think about that circumcision. He says, when I get, once he circumcised them, he set them apart like he did Abraham. Up until that time, they were basically Gentile Hebrews. They had the mindset of Egypt. They had the uncircumcision of Egypt. They had a golden calf out there. They got that from Egypt. And when God had them circumcised, he started remembering his Abrahamic, well not start, he just showing them, he always remembered it by the way. The point is, he says, the reproach of Egypt is off of you now. Let's keep reading. Wherefore the name of the place is called, verse 9, Gilgal unto this day. That means the reproach is rolled away. Verse 10. And the children of Israel entered in, uh, in Captain Gilgal and kept the Passover. Remember on Sunday, we started looking at the Passover. So be with us Sunday, we're going to look more at that. And kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the, of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. Now, watch this, everybody. I didn't mention this on Sunday. In Exodus 12, when God brought them out, he gave them Passover. He said, this is going to be a perpetual thing for every generation forever. Keep the Passover on the 14th day of Abel. But what did they eat for the 40 years they were in the wilderness? Manna. Manna. God would send manna down. They had quail and other things, but manna. Angels food, it says in Psalms. Angels eat manna. Now watch this. Notice what it says here. Verse number 11. And they did eat the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Unleavened cakes and parched corn the selfsame day. Now they would go back to that. Watch verse 12. And the manna ceased on the morrow. For 40 years of eating manna, and then God <laughs> says, now you're in the land, no more manna. No more bread in the wilderness. You can go back to keeping my feast day. Interesting. They did the Passover. All right, let's keep going. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten the old corn of the land. <laughs> Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Praise the Lord. Can I tell you something? Just for a memorial, God had them collect some manna, put it in a little pot, and in that Ark of the Covenant, you had Aaron's rod that budded, supernatural almond rod that budded, showing resurrection. It showed God was with Aaron and not nobody else. You had the Ten Commandments. You had the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the second ones that Moses made. God broke the first one. Moses broke those. God says, come up Moses and make a copy. And he did. You had the manna, the bowl of manna. Just a reminder to Israel how God supernaturally sustained them, kept them in the wilderness. Awesome. So they didn't have to eat it anymore. Forty years of eating manna and eating quail and so forth. But now they eating the fruit of the land. Verse 13. Now, here's what I want you to see. I want you to kind of see what's going on. Now they're about to go into the land. Joshua, type of Jesus Christ, same name. Joshua, Jehovah's Savior. Jesus, Jehovah, it's, it's the Greek, Hebrew and Greek. Same equivalent. Joshua is a type of Jesus. Moses, the law is not taking him in there. God's grace is Jesus Christ, Joshua. Now watch this. Right as they're about to, you know, get the land, they're going to fight now. Get these. When it says they're in the land, it doesn't mean they have the land yet. There's a bunch of giant Gentile heathens, uncircumcised, gigantic men that Satan put there. 
who are on that land. Now they got to fight. Watch this. <laughs> Verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with, a sword, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Now look at Joshua's courage. Moses says to Joshua before he dies, Be courageous, be courage, be very courageous, have some courage. Joshua sees this man, and Joshua, he walks up to him. But who is this guy? Because Joshua had much confidence. But this is no ordinary man. Watch this. This man with a sword drawn in his hand. Interesting. I want you to see the symbolism. He's standing there with it's a man with a sword drawn in his hand. He has his sword out. That's important when we look at what we're supposed to do. Because although this we have a sword spiritually as part of that whole armor, that offensive weapon, you have to be ready with it, man. You have to know God's word for you today. When we talk about rightly dividing God's word, you need to know what God is saying today. And that's only found in Paul's epistles. Romans through Philemon, the mystery, the gospel of grace. Satan wants us to mix everything and not rightly divide God's word, but to mix it. And when it, when it says this man had a sword in his hand, he was ready for battle. You got to be ready. Let's go. Look at this. Joshua went unto him, end of verse 13, and said unto him, I love this question. Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Joshua was ready to battle. Joshua didn't play games, man. And I don't care how fearsome that man looked. And I, that man was, was, I'm about to tell you who I think that man was. Joshua was ready to go. He had the power of God. He had faith. And he says, listen, you for us or for our adversaries? That's going to determine my course of action. Joshua was ready to take him out. But look at the answer of this man. Verse number 14. And he said, nay, no, 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 but as the, as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? Now, what's going on here is a lot to get into, but this is, I believe, is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, when he talks about the captain of the Lord, as far as the father, the, the, the one who leads the battle, he's like David and Michael, the archangels, like Joab. You read about David and Joab. Joab was his general, but the commander-in-chief was David. The commander-in-chief of the heavenly armies is, God, is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we're going to see in Israel, that he was there to fight with them. All through their fighting, even though they fought in the flesh, man, man in the flesh, these Gentiles, what was behind them was a spiritual power that they could just overpower these Gentiles. You've got to remember, there's a spiritual power behind them. Keep that in mind. Because when we have our whole arm and we have the sword of the spirit, there's a spiritual power that is beyond human comprehension. Keep that in mind. Notice what he says here. Here's why I think it's the Lord. <clears throat> Every other time, by the way, Joshua would never bow down to a mere mortal man. And even if Joshua bowed down to a, an angel, sometimes you see people when their angels would appear, they would bow down. Those angels says, no, 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 get up. Worship God. Don't bow down to an angel. What we see from about this man, he didn't tell Joshua to get up. That's why I think it's the Lord himself. The only man in scripture where people bow down to him and, he's, and he's, he, he accepted it was the Lord Jesus. People, when he walked, they bowed down to him. He didn't say, hold on, get up. I'm just a mere mortal man. Uh-huh. He let them. He let them worship because he's God. And that's what I think is going on here, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Verse number 14, he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? Sometimes you read your Bible and say, the Lord of Sabaoth. Uh, Isaiah would call him the Lord of Sabaoth. Paul calls him in Romans 11, the, the Lord of Sabaoth. That means the Lord of hosts. And he has a host, an angelic army, ready to battle. By the way, keep going. Keep, keep reading this. <coughs> Verse 15. Excuse me, 14. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Now, we're going we're to end in verse 15, but I want you to see, because this man did not correct Joshua, 
didn't say, hold on, I'm just a man or an angel. That's why I believe it's a pre-incarnate vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? A pre-incarnate appearance. Verse 15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, does that sound familiar? Yeah. What, what happened with Moses, the burning bush? When the I am that I am appeared, he says, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the... That's the same thing. That, that's why I believe this is the Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate and before he was in his flesh, okay? All right, so I want you to understand something about this sword. It's the sword of the Lord himself, but he had it drawn in his hand. Interesting, he knew it was Joshua, but he was ready. That's what I'm saying. It's just interesting. He was always ready. We're going to see some stuff. We're going to go all the way to the book of Revelation, maybe get through it in this study, if not next Wednesday, and we're going to see this is a consistent thing. So when Paul tells us to have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, understand that this is just the norm in Scripture. We need to be ready for the attack, to attack our enemy, Satan. Look at Isaiah 49. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah 49, if you will. We're just working our way right on through Scripture. Isaiah chapter 49. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Now when the Messiah comes... He's not only coming to bless Israel, he's coming to put down the law of the Lord. He's going to rule over his enemies with a rod of iron. But notice what it says about this Messiah. Chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles, those are the, the, the Gentile isles, unto me. Isaiah 49. And hearken ye people from far. So God has a word through Isaiah to you Gentiles. The Lord hath called me. So here's the Messiah. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. That's true about the Lord Jesus. When we get to the book of Luke in, in, in this study in, 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 in the New Testament, we're going to see that somebody says something about this child to Mary. And May, Mary just, I'm sure it gave her goosebumps and she trembled. Because this, this child, even the angel came to her and to, and to Joseph and, and said, listen, this child is the Holy One of God. He was prophesied about our Lord Jesus Christ. He was mentioned before he was conceived. Before Mary even conceived, said, You're gonna, he's going to call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people, Israel, from their sins. Now we know through the Apostle Paul, he didn't just come for a ransom for many but a ransom for how many? All oh, to be testified in due time, Paul says, 1 Timothy. All right, let's keep reading. I want you to see the first thing it says about this Messiah, this, this chosen one. Yeah, and he hath made my mouth like a what? Sharp sword. Well, how can God make a mouth like a sharp sword? Yeah, he put his word in his hand, in his mouth. I'll show you how the Lord Jesus... I, I marvel at the Lord Jesus doing his earthly ministry. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How he, how he walked. His humility. But I can tell you what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he went on the offense, he gave the word of God. That's how he attacked. Bam. Oh, when, when I show you what, he, what happened with Satan on those temptations, how he dealt with the ancient enemy. He just, he just destroyed, say, so just ate them up with the word of God. And for you and I today, that's why I, I yell and scream and pull out my little tiny hair. I even got some, some I got three gray hair in three years in, in California. Then now a gray strand to my boot here. Every year I get one. It's pressure, man. You need to understand the mystery. You need to know Paul's epistles. Intimately, I read them every day. I know, I know, but I, I get to know more and more and more. Like, like I know, I knew my wife. Now I know her ten years, and like that couple who've been married seventy-two years at that senior home where I work, well, she just died recently. He had seventy-two. He knew her more intimately. God wants you to know His Word. He ate Paul's epistles that way. That's why it, it, it frustrates us when we deal with brethren and think they have, you, you you can always unpack more. It's God's Word. It, it's a re there was only one man who knew the word of God in every nuance perfectly and it took him being God himself the word was made flesh and the flesh became the word 
At 30 years old, Jesus of Nazareth knew the word of God perfectly. He's the only man who could do that. We have to constantly, for the rest of our life, yea, for eternity. It took the eternal Son of God to build up God's word. And watch this. Verse 2. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hit me. The Father, God the Father was taking the Lord each day from his birth and preparing him with the word. And made me a polished shaft and a quiver hath he and his quiver had to hit me. Now, what is that? Remember I said he had that bow? Well, it's like he's a, a hunter, and he has the shaft, and he pulls these arrows out. And that arrow is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he just said, Ryan knows more about this. I'm not into all this, but uh, Orion's belt. You know, you see the, this, the, in the stars, the constellation, and it looks like this guy has a born arrow. Yeah. See, all that stuff. It's counterfeit, but it, it, now, but it's all represent what the Lord Jesus Christ, all the constellations, all the the, 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 the the signs of the zodiac, all that. He's a quiver. Excuse me, he's a polished shaft. He's like an arrow. He was in his quiver, and when God wants to attack, he he puts out his word, his word made flesh. Now, the Lord Jesus. Okay. A couple more verses here as we hear. I just want to show you some. Verse 3. You want some encouragement? You want some encouragement when you share God's word of His grace and people reject you, think you're crazy and a cult? What is that little church? People are not teaching that. What is Let me show you what happened to the Lord Jesus. He had a little flock. The best man that ever lived. The best preacher that ever lived. The best teacher that ever lived. The most nice, kind, perfect human being ever. Only one. The Lord Jesus. Adam for a time until he... Oh, Lord Jesus. He had a little flock of people in his own country. Small group. Watch this. Verse number th three. And said unto me, here's what the father said unto him, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. By the way, he's talking about the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the true Israel. When God changed Jacob's name to Israel, see that El Elohim? God, princes of God. He changed Jacob's name to that in preparation for the son of Jacob, Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would come through Judah. The true Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, see, this is a person. I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and in my work with my God. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I did your will, Father. I, 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 I did what you told me to do. And all I got is a little flock. You think the humanity of Jesus was? Read the book of Luke. Interesting is in Luke. Because it shows his humanity. The Lord was like us. Even though he was God, he was still a man. And he, look, he had times, not, he never had a time of doubt. He had perfect faith. But what he did have, he, he had every human emotion we have. And when your friends and family and people reject the truth, it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts. Your loved ones. His own family members didn't believe on him. That's what he's saying. I've labored in vain. I spent my strength for naught and in vain. But really, he, he, the father tells him, no, 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 no. Even though they won't believe you, I see what you've done. What does it say about the Lord Jesus? He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There, wherefore, God, had, uh, Philippians 2, had highly exalted him, Philippians 2, 11. And given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, earth, and under earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, the righteous judge. See, it looked like from the outside that it was an ineffective ministry. You got a little flock. Even after you went up, you claim, hey, it's only 120 in Jerusalem. It's nobody. Look at this. Look, we look. Can't go by that. You got to go by what is the truth of God's word. And today, you're not going to, you're going to have little flocks into God's grace because Satan has a policy just like with Israel to withstand what God is doing in the body of Christ. 
But I can tell you what Satan hates. He hates to hear the rightly divided word, yea, the mystery go forth. He hates to hear it. Let me show you that. Let's keep going. Go with me to Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. And we're going to go back to Matthew in a little bit. We have time. But not tonight. We'll be back there um, next week. Look at Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew 10 verse 32. I just find it fascinating, this issue of a sword. sword ex swords existed before mankind. You hear these this, this stupid uh, people with the theory of evolution. It's still a theory, by the way. I know they call it evolution. It's still a theory. They, they haven't reproduced it. it, it it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a phony. But you got to get God out of there. And they talk about reinventing the wheel. Like, it's like you got, you got some cavemen. <laughs> 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 wheels, in, wheels were invented by God. Yeah. God's chariot has wheels before man came along. Adam was the smartest man that ever lived outside the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived 930 years in an almost perfect conditions and perfect body. Way better than what we have today. And his wisdom that he learned over... I'm 41 years old. Do you think... If I live 930 more years on this earth learning God's word, y'all listen to these tapes at 41 be like, dude, they know nothing. That's what it should be. Adam, he wasn't some caveman. Adam, our federal head father, that man, when, at the time of his death, he knew an awful lot. He was the only man who could say, I was a direct creation of Almighty God. The only man. Even Eve was created out of him. Adam knew a lot in 930 years. Even if, if we live 930 years, how much wisdom will we have? I, I, I deal with 90-year-olds, okay, 90, 95-year-old people every day. The stuff that they know from the world as far as when they were little children to today, the technology scene, they only had transistor radios. They didn't have televisions. They had the Model T Ford. There was no spaceship. There was no computers. There was no cell phones. There was no TV. There was no Internet. There was... That's in 80 years. How much you think Adam known in, nine, in 930 years? There's no cavemen. Nobody had to invent the will. God invented the will. Amen. Amen. That's just some shenanigans to get God out of your life. Well, look at, look at um, Matthew chapter number 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore... Now, now, by the way, Matthew is speaking to a different group of people. That's not the body of Christ. Because... If you don't remember that when you're reading these passages, you're going to think you can lose your salvation. Because they didn't have salvation the way we do, a moment of time of trusting the blood of Christ. He hadn't died yet either. Trust the blood of Christ. You have everlasting life. And your performance is not going to keep you out of heaven. It'll affect your reward, whether you reign with Christ or not. But that's a separate issue. That's a sanctification issue. But in this prophetic program with Israel... Your faith and works work together. Your position and practice for justification work together. Now look with me, if you will, verse 32. I got I got to say that. Every day, every Sunday, some church, some preacher teaches this passage and tell people, boy, if you don't confess Jesus, he won't confess you. And tell us, tell us assembly that. Let's look at it. Whosoever therefore, therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. That's for Israel. You had to confess Jesus. It says about the Pharisees. Many of the Pharisees believed on him in the book of John, but they would not confess him, fearing the Jews. Their place, their religious place. I got a sneaky little secret for you guys. There are preachers out there right now who understand, or not understand, they know about Paul's unique separate ministry, but they won't teach it. Yes, yeah, sad. Because they're going to lose something. Power, prestige, money, filthy lucre, uh, you know, fame, fortune, all that stuff. All the stuff of this world. Because they're not looking at the righteous judge and the terror of the Lord. We're going to see something about the sword as we end by the terror of the Lord. That's the same thing that happened back there that people knew who he was, but they were afraid to say it. 
People know about this separate, unique ministry of Paul, but they said, if I, if I make this known, I'm going to get kicked out of my denial. I'm going to lose all. Well, I'm gonna lose all then. Paul says, of whom, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but what? Dumb. Dumb. That I may win Christ. Philippians 3, when we get to that passage after finished Ephesians, oh, if you don't understand the issue of joint heir sanctification, you can't understand that passage in Philippians 3. Now, with these people, you had to, you had to confess it. The Jew says, I believe, therefore I speak. Let's keep going. Verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. They're not getting into the kingdom. Now, Paul says that a believer can deny Christ today. If we deny him, he will also deny us. 2 Timothy 2. But it's not denying us heaven. In works, you can deny him. Titus 1.16. That's when you reject the mystery. You're denying him. And what will happen is, he'll deny you reigning with him at the judgment seat of Christ. He's not denying us the kingdom a position, uh, uh, entrance in the kingdom. You have that citizenship. He's denying you a position of reign and rule in his kingdom. If you deny, you don't qualify. But with Israel, if they deny him, they're going to be denied. He's going to say, Father, don't let him in. He says, yes, son, I'm not getting in. All right, let's keep going. I love this. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Don't you see these bumper stickers? Jesus is love, he's peace. He is. He's the Prince of Peace. But nobody quotes this passage. The Lord is out of his mouth going, I didn't come to send peace on the earth. I Look at it, verse 34. Think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I, come, I came not to send peace, but a what? Sword. And another passage says, but division. How about that? Nobody tells you that Jesus came to give a sword and division. See, the word divides. Man, truth divides. You start teaching the truth of the Apostle Paul, guess what? Your friends and family are going to divide them. They're going to rightly divide themselves right away from you. <laughs> Cricket. Crickets. What a Q U. That's what Jim spells it. C R I Q U E T S. Crickets. You, you add your own crickets to it. That's how Jim spells it. Watch this. Verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. So people don't realize about the Lord. For I have come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own what? Household. Listen, Christ, he don't play around. Family, you know, we'd be worried about our family. Oh, I wonder if they get a chance to believe after the rapture. No, not if they get, no. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation, Paul said if you reject the grace of God today, no, no, no. See, Jesus Christ doesn't care about your father, your mother, your preacher, your denomination. He cares about, do you, well, look at the verse. Verse number 37. He that loveth father. Well, my dad's a, your dad's a Catholic? Okay, no. My, my dad's a, that, no, I don't. He that loveth father or, mo or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth the son or daughter more than me is not. In another passage, he says, if you don't hate your father and your mother, you're not worthy. You say, why would he tell him hate? This is the passage that shows you that he, he doesn't mean hate. He says he means love him, but he means your love for the Lord Jesus compared to your love from your for your family, your mother, father, children, husband, wife, should be such as, as if you hate them. See how deep that devotion is? It's no joke. Now, Again, that will hinder a Jew from getting into his earthly kingdom. Now, for you and I today, the principle is still the same. I know people, they learn this. They go talk to dear old dad, who's a, who's a Baptist preacher. Dad says, no, you can't believe that stuff, man. And they say, okay, dad. And they just move on. Instead of saying, hold on, Dad, let, let's search the scriptures, see what God has to say right in the divine. Love you, Dad, but I love the Lord Jesus Christ more. See, he came to bring a sword, and that sword divides. 
what the Word of God is designed to do is to cause offense. It is. It's, it's, it's testing people's hearts. We have about five, ten minutes. I want to show you something. Anybody who says they love the Lord, I tell Chris, I say, the moment you say that, or, oh, Lord, permeate my being with your word, I go, watch out. <laughs> You're in trouble. You, potentially. Depends on how you respond. That is a good thing. You want God to permeate you. You want to know the Lord. But I'm saying the grace message will come into your life. God will make sure someone gives you the right to divide the word, and then you have to make the decision. Count the cost. Am I going to believe what I'm seeing in Scripture, or am I going to believe? As soon as you walk out of here, Satan's just going to be trying to take. He says the fowls of the air are going to try to take what you've learned. Let's keep looking. Look at Luke chapter number two. Remember, I said about Mary. Oh man, we only got five minutes. That's okay. We'll pick it up. We'll pick it up next week because I got some real good verses. We're going to look at this sword. Look at Luke chapter two, verse thirty-four. Remember, I, I told you how Mary was given. Uh, a prophecy about her son before he was even conceived. Well, when she dedicated him at the temple, as any Jewish woman would, take her, man, her, her male child down to dedicate him. Notice what happened when she gets there. Luke chapter 2, verse 34. And Simeon, so this old man Simeon, all this old man did was wait in the temple and say, Lord, just let me live till I see Israel's salvation, till I see the Messiah. The guy just waited. He knew some time. He said, let wait. And boy, when Mary and Joseph brought that little boy, Simeon says, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. He, he takes the baby. Oh, watch it. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. He's saying, it's going to be a wild ride with this boy. Now look at the look at the 35. Look at the parentheses. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine, thy own soul also. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What does he mean by that? You know what he's saying? Mary. He's the Messiah. You're going to have to trust your own son. He's going to test hearts. He's going to test hearts. He's going to, even his own mother is going to have to trust him. Notice that, yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. What Jesus Christ came to do, remember that set that variance? His very presence in Israel made people choose. We got to end, but there's a, there's a doctrine today that is so divisive and so just, I can't even, it's called the issue of being a joint heir with Christ. A pinnacle doctrine of the Apostle Paul. Everything in his epistles is about that, serving the Lord, faith, and ministry. And this thing, it, 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 I, I can't, I just, it has brought such division amongst dispensational circles, it's insane. Somebody told me about it just yesterday. Just, it's almost like, which side of the fence you're on? Well, that was the Lord. Truth, truth. In Israel, who is this man? Who is this man? Is he the Messiah or not? And based upon your answer in Israel, yes, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. No, he's not. That was your choice, man. And it divided the nation. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. Mary had herself to make a determination on who this man is. A prophet is not without honor except amongst his own home, people, country, nation, family. In other words, people appreciated Jesus Christ more than his own family. His brothers didn't even believe on him until after he was resurrected. Right before his death, they were going to go down to Jerusalem for the feast, and his brothers asked him, says, hey, you need to go down there and show your little magic tricks, your miracles. Do your little tricks. He said, no, I won't go. And as soon as they left, he went right stealthily behind them. He said he just waited for them to go. He, was, he said, I'm not going with you guys. Because his own brothers didn't believe him. James, Joseph, Jews, Simon, they didn't believe him until after his resurrection. Okay? I'm just saying that the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God, causes offense. 
It's a sword. Now let's end in Romans 13, because it's a very interesting thing here in Romans 13. Now when Paul talks about a sword, and we're going to pick up next week, okay? In Romans 13, Paul mentions a sword in a different capacity, but really not. In Ephesians, he's talking about a spiritual sword. It's not a physical sword. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Please don't go out and get a sword and stab somebody. You will go to jail, go to prison. In fact, Romans 13 for you if you think about doing that. The sword is a spiritual one, but it's just as powerful and effective. In fact, it's better than a physical sword, the Word of God. When I deal with lost people or saved people, I make them, not make them, I ask them, I show them the verses. That's why I have you look at the verses, take them in your eyes, I, I, I share the verses. When you got a question, I make you give me the verse, because I understand Satan doesn't like that and you need that. There's power there. Satan and his angels hate, and his devils hate the word of God preached right. Next week we'll pick up in the Gospels where the, the temptation be here. But notice here, Paul is talking about let every soul, verse 1, let every soul, or Romans 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. So even all those heathens out there who run, who run in the country, the positions of authority is, is a, or, it's ordained by God, not the people, but the positions, and they're going to be held accountable from everybody from the president on down, if you have a position of authority, you're going to be held accountable by Almighty God. All right, verse number two. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. God had to maintain order in humanity. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, if you're a believer, you're not going to go to hell if you kill somebody. What you're going to do is there's going to be some, some temp well, temporal punishment. You're going to go to prison. And there's going to be some loss of reward up there. Determined. Don't kill, don't murder nobody. Thou shalt not kill. Okay? You defend yourself, but don't. You've got to be justifiable homicide. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him to do with evil. The whole thing is, God created human government to restrain evil. And even if you're a believer, don't go out and do evil. Do good. Now, this principle, the terror of the Lord, is similar to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. The motivation for a believer is the terror of the Lord, the judgment of Christ. But the principle is this. If you're doing good as a believer... There's not going to be any terror at the judgment seat of Christ. The good works are in the grace message. That's why you got to learn Paul. There's no terror for us who are doing good. If you love the mystery and you operate and you're, 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 you're doing what you guys are doing right now, there won't be any terror of the Lord at the judgment seat. It's for the believers, the terror of the Lord are for the believers who are not doing the good works of God's grace. The ones who are doing the evil works, the evil workers. Right? Paul calls evil workers living. If you do evil works, whether you do it now, the civil authorities will get you. If you do it now, as a believer, the righteous judge will get you. Everybody got that? Same principle. So you fear, walking in fear and trembling is not walking on eggshells. It's going about doing good. I say, I'm going to do good, Lord. You said do good. I'm not going to do evil. I don't want your terror, so I'm going to do good. I don't want the police to bang down my door, so I'm not going around shooting people, pulling up a gun. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to live a quiet and peaceful life so the police won't mess with me. Well, live, live that same quiet and peaceful life of good works as a believer, and the Lord won't mess with you there. He'll praise you. Thou shalt have... Look at that, look at that. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So if you're doing good works, it's not a terror now or then. If you're, doing, if you're an evil worker, it's going to be bad now and then. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Not just the governmental power here. Be afraid of that power there, the Lord. Remember that sister said, oh, I'm so afraid. She just, she just went against right there, right there. Mm -hmm. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. What's going to happen to the judgment of Christ? You do good works of God's grace. 
And every man should have praise of the Lord. Okay, We have to end, but next week as we continue looking at the sword of the Spirit, and then we're going to see the issue of prayer. The final two pieces are the offensive weapons we have. The, the Word of God and prayer. Prayer is an offensive weapon. I'll show you how, how that is next week. If you're here tonight, or if you're listening, and no one ever loved you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure? The key words are for sure where you're going to spend eternity. If your church, religion, denomination can't tell you for sure that if you died right now, you would wake up in the presence of the Lord. Well, God wants you to know for sure. He told, he sent the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, verse 8, he says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, people quote John 3, 16. You see it in baseball games. The Giants in the World Series, you see the guy with the John 3, 16. We were walking, somebody put it in chalk on the ground. But what is that for God so loved the world? How did he show that love? Well, he gave his only God's son. Well, to do what? In prophecy, he, he's given him to the world as, as a king. But in the mystery, what we learn from Paul, what God gave was the blood of his son for our sins. God loves you. Christ died for you. Trust his shed blood and God will give you everlasting life. No works. Just believe that he shed his precious blood. And that's sufficient for you. And God will save you. Now, what about good works? Well, good works are involved after you're saved, not before. Not to keep you saved. You're saved forever. Your good works have to do with a reward. If you do the work of faith, the labor of love, and patiently endure the sufferings, of and with Christ, he has something. He's going to praise you and say, join with me in my heavenly kingdom. Rule and reign with me. That's called the hope of glory. The rejoice and hope of glory of God. We'll help you with that, okay? Alright, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can get into your holy, righteous word. We can learn about uh, um, the, the truth of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And how a sword has power uh, all the way back in the beginning in Genesis, you put that sword there uh, to keep the way of the true life. You put your word out there that says, now you must offer the blood. That sword wasn't to keep them out forever, Father. It was, it was to keep them out until they could bring the blood. We pray that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is, 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 it goes forth through our ministry, the power of it, to save souls, to bring them nigh unto you, Father. We pray that the, 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 the terror of the Lord would be upon us so that not not that we would not do evil, be not evil workers, but good workers, so that we might receive the praise of the Lord. We look forward to your coming and the judgment seat of Christ. But Father, let us redeem the time. Let us study out your word, learn what your word has to say, rightly divided, as we looked at all through Scripture today. May we continue to grow in the mystery of Christ given to the Apostle Paul. May we continue to grow in understanding of your word, rightly divided, as relate to the mystery when Paul talks about something check it out. May we continue to be edified and, and, and have the eyes of our understanding being enlightened each and every day. And when we come together, what a wonderful thing it is to share in Christ together with saints. So fathers, we have our Q&A. We just ask for uh, your blessing upon it as well. We thank you in Christ's name.